Welcome to Merchant Seeds Cup of Joe. On this episode, Mike Tweedy from Pattern Ag talks about new DNA technology and soil testing that will help you make the right decisions for your farm. Hear about what's happening in fields this time of year and tools you can use to protect your yield. The EPA announced a 60-day comment period for Dicamba. Make sure you read the article in the description from Progressive Farmer. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Welcome to Mershman Seeds Cup of Joe. Today, we have Ben, Lynn, and Turk, and a special guest. I'll let Ben introduce him. Yeah, so today we have Mike Tweedy on with us. Mike is the Director of Sales for Pattern Ag. And uh, Mike, I'm gonna go ahead and let you give a little bit of background behind how you came to Pattern Ag, what Pattern Ag just is, is just a little bit, and then we'll hit you with some more specific questions. Sounds great, and thank you for the invitation. Happy to be here this morning. Um, so yeah, I, I came to Pattern Ag about a year and a half ago, uh, but my, his, the his, my history started really in Southern Illinois in a, a small county called Union County. Um, and we uh, have a farm there that, uh, so it was founded in the uh, around 1800, and we've been farming there for that entire time. So it's literally in our roots. Agriculture has been, you know, what I've uh, been involved in since I was six years old and started working with for my grandpa. Um, but uh, I've, been, I've spent most of my career in agriculture with both large companies and smaller new tech startups like Pattern Ag, and you know, really what brought me here was what we're doing, which is predictive soil analytics. You know, there's an old saying that farmers have 40 years to guess right, and because there's so much of what, uh, what happens on a farm is you're using your intuition guided by his history and what you think might be out there. But what we really don't understand is what is happening below ground at a biological level. And so um, what, we, what we do is we use um, technology that's been around for over 20 years and it's uh it's dna sequencing uh so it's been used to map the human genome it's been used to um uh identify things like covid in patients um so it's not new but it is new to agriculture and the reason why it is uh, we've been able to bring it into production agriculture at scale is because the cost of sequencing has really come down. So what that allows us to do now is to look at biology <clears throat> that's in the soil and be able to identify things that are robbing top end yield from soybeans and corn. And things like sudden death syndrome, corn rootworm, soybean cyst nematode, and and variety of other diseases that uh, that impact the growers. And you know our goal is simple: make things known that are unknown, so the grower can choose the right variety, hybrid, seed treatment, and so forth to improve top end yield. Mike, I just think this technology is is a game changer. If I was a farmer, you know, we like we say. Uh, you know how deep the water is before you dive in. And um, I know Mersman Seeds is highly endorsing uh, Pattern Ag and, and encouraging our dealers to sign up to be dealers for you to, to do this and offer this service uh, an opportunity to find out what you have because our seed treatments that we have, our genetics, if we know what the problems are out there in the field prior to purchasing that seed, we, we can get some additional yield for the farmers. And, and I, I think that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, uh, you know, like right now, we're seeing problems with sudden death showing up there. You know, if, if you had known that you had a problem with sudden death, you know, you could have maybe uh, looked a little harder at that sudden death score on that soybean variety added uh, sulfur on it. And of course, this year with our new starting line seed treatment, we're adding heads up, which is gonna give uh, some additional season long protection. So there's things that we can do to prevent a disaster, but we need to know up front. Absolutely, and, and that's, that's the magic behind what we do is we take really complex metadata. And what I mean by metadata is, you know, as an example, your typical soil test today for micros and macros is 10 data points. When we run our analysis on a pound of composite sample of soil through our machine, we get 10 million reads. So we're looking at the entire soil microbiome, about 10,000 different species. But the magic behind what we do is our bioinformatics platform 
that uses algorithms to find very specific things like sudden death syndrome inoculum that exists in the soil. And so we can not only tell the grower it's there, but we can also tell them how bad it is from a low, medium and high scale so that it can inform that decision when you sit down with your Mershman seed dealer to say, I need this particular variety and I am going to need a seed treatment. Or if it's not there, then you don't need that seed treatment. So it brings that um, assurance of making the right choice before the seed goes in the ground. And it's not just sudden death syndrome. You can do white mold, brown stem rot. Uh, pythium. We yeah, we've, we've got a number of them. We, and we just added more this year so we can do Phytophthora, white mold, soybean stem rots, uh, soybean stem canker, SDS, sun, uh, soybean cyst nematode, Rhizoc, Pythium, Fusarium, um, Gibberella stalk rot, Anthracnose, and corn rootworm. And not only just corn rootworm, we can tell you whether it's northern or western corn rootworm so you can understand if you have extended diapause. And so all these things impact not only just seed uh, and seed treatment decisions, but also management systems, your, uh, how you need to, if you're going to need to rotate to a different crop. And so when you have that view of the threat levels that exist, then you can make uh, more informed decisions. Well, and then you're working on a predictive method for tar spot. Is that not correct too? Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're going to be doing some test beta testing this year of adding uh, some new pathogens in for next year that are going to be, you know, that live in the, uh, in the residue. Uh, that will be a 2023 product that we'll bring out. So, Mike, another thing, you, you know, while you're out there soil testing, you're also offering that you can do the nutrients also. Is that correct? Yeah, we uh, so we look at fertility in a couple of different ways. Um, one is just your basic Malik test. We've added that. That is not core to our business. Um, that's that's available just about anywhere today. We added that at the request of growers who said, "Hey, I don't want to send samples to two different labs. Can you just do?" Can you do the uh, micro and macro? So we added the pro nutrient panel to uh, uh, our product offering. But the other thing that we look at is biofertility, things like um, you know nitrogen fixation. Do I need uh, an inoculant or not? Uh, denitrification potential. Do I need a ni nitrogen stabilizer? And again, we're looking at these things at the biological level. Another interesting one is phosphorus solubil solubilization potential. And what that simply means is, do the genetic pathways exist in your soil that can break down the phosphorus that's actually there? There is uh, plenty of phosphorus in the fields that can be that the grower can mine themselves if they know where to put that biological product. And so we can tell the grower where those products need to be applied. So, so what you're saying is, besides diseases and insects, uh, you can also look at the 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 soil health and you know I, I know we ran it on our test plot and we found out that we have you know it, it was it's ground that we just recently got it's two acres and uh, it, it was a desert when it came to biological activity in the soil based on your tests and we, we definitely need to add rhizobia uh, for nitrogen fixation and also uh, and get some um, some biologicals going to help on that those other areas that you just just, just talked about. Yeah, we look at we don't just look at the bad stuff. We look at the good stuff. You know, what is the what is the health of that soil? So we're looking at specifically at mycorrhizal fungi, and we're looking at the levels that exist in there. We have our our um, data science team and our our uh, microbiologists have identified. We know which specific mycorrhizal fungi that we're looking for, and so we DNA sequence each one of those things that we're looking for. And then we build a, an algorithm that looks specifically for those when we, when we DNA sequence it. So, um, you know, I guess what we do is really, really complex, but the beauty of the product is that it's super simple to, you know, to understand at a glance, you can see the things that need to be done, just like you described on that new piece of uh, ground that you just acquired that two acres, you were able to see at a glance, Hey, I've got, I've got these things going on that I need to, uh, you know, I, I need to add a, an inoculant to it and I need to get some biology going in this field. And so there's a number of different ways that you can do that. Well, ironically, and again, only two acres, uh, but we were, we had one variety out there that was showing some brown stem rot. And I, and I told Ben, I says, 
and Turk was there too, and we said, gosh, it doesn't really make sense. It's, it's been alfalfa for all these years, and, and then we've only had soybeans on it for a few years. So we got, we got your, your test results out, and by gosh, in that particular part of the field, it showed that there was a, a moderate level of brown stem rot, and the variety that we planted there was susceptible to brown stem rot. It wasn't real bad, but it, it definitely matched up, and we felt really strong about that. And I got to give a lot of credit to Ben and discovering your company, uh, you know, as something that we thought would be a great tool uh, to introduce to our customers because, you know, farming is such an expensive business, and, and there's so many options out there on things you can do and spend your money on. Wouldn't it be nice just to know that when you are spending your money, you're going to get a return? And like you said, if you don't need it, don't spend it. And uh, that's the, the nice thing about it. And, and it sounds like your company is evolving. In other words, you're just going to keep making this product better and better and better as time goes on. Yeah. What's, what I love about our company is that it doesn't have an end to it, right? That we're never going to be done building the product. And the beauty or, you know, the benefit to the grower and to the seed dealer is that once you get that view of that field, we turn that biological information into gigabytes of data that go up into a cloud. And what I mean by that and what the benefit is, is that when we add new things and we'll constantly be adding new things like pathogens and, and, uh, and beneficial things it automatically updates past reports. So let's say you've done business with us and, and tested your fields for five years. Every time we bring something new out, it automatically updates past reports. So you can actually get a real-time view of the his biological history of that field. And that's what's unique about what we do. There's no added cost to that. It's just, you know, it's just going to, it, the product is going to continue to evolve over time. And, what, what, what I love about utilizing metadata is the more fields and acres that we get on and the more data that we have, the more efficient that we become. So it becomes like a flywheel effect and the grower benefits from that. Can you share with us some of the general trends that you're seeing out there? I, I know you've done thousands and thousands of acres. And so obviously, you know, some of the red flags that are showing up there on a consistent basis. Can you share a little bit of some of the generalities of what you're seeing as far as problems that farmers are facing? Yeah. So, you know, we've, we tested in the past year, a couple, several hundred thousand acres across the Midwest. Our footprint is really the Dakotas all the way over to Ohio um, and all the I states, obviously. And so some of the things that we're seeing that were surprised, you know, really surprising to me is that corn rootworm, um, you know, Iowa pretty much has the highest pressure of any of the fields that we've tested. About 50 percent uh, come in at medium to high pressure uh, requiring, you know, a trait or uh, some sort of a treatment. But other states like Illinois are very low and it's really uh, isolated to, you know, above Interstate 80. I don't, that may or may not surprise uh, some people. Indiana, Minnesota, and Ohio, very low, less than 30% of those fields coming in. But when you look at diseases, things like fusarium, um, rhizoctonia, pythium, and SDS, they're coming in greater than 50% of the fields with medium to high levels of, uh, of inoculum that are in the soil. Now, we're not at the point yet where we're going to predict the um, expression of those diseases, but what we can tell you is what the threat levels are, which would inform variety and seed treatment decisions that need to go on. So um, those are those are some of the trends that we're seeing. Is the, the disease levels are far higher than people think, and you know the real enjoyment that we get is providing these results back to growers. And the growers being able to see what is happening in their own fields that they never knew before. So much like you described with that, that two acre uh, plot or two acre field that you just purchased, uh, we've got others that have been farmed for years and years. And we have specific examples in southern Minnesota where growers were realizing that they had really high levels of sudden death syndrome. And everybody around that area swore that there was no sudden death syndrome. And, uh, and, and, you know, the aha moments occur 
when they say, okay, now that, now I understand why I've been um, tapped at 50 bushels on uh, soybeans in these fields and my neighbors are getting 70. And so it begins to answer questions, you know, growers, growers know the fields like the back of their hand, you know, especially ones that they've been farming forever. They know where the low yield spots are. They know where the high yield spots are, but what we, but what, what we bring to the table is we can then begin to explain the whys behind the what's that are occurring. So you can break it down, you know, your normal standard process is what, 10 acre grids? Is that what you do? What, what, what's the farmer's options there? Yeah, so uh, the farmer can, can go as dense as they want to. We can go down to one acre grids or we can take single samples. But our standard product um, that we've tested for over four years consistently comes back as kind of our sweet spot in the mid, in Midwestern fields is 10 acre grids. And so what we do is we, once the field boundaries are uploaded into our system, we follow the combine out of the field or our samplers follow the combine out of the field in the fall. We, um, we sample on 10 acre grids. We pull 12 to 14 cores across that 10 acres and that goes into a single composite sample. And that single composite sample is then what goes through our system in California. We don't subcontract anything except for the soil sampling. Everything else we do in-house and it's really like a machine. So when you think about the density at which we're sampling, it's at about less than an acre uh, per core that's pulled, which is far more dense than any other kind of sampling. And the reason why we do that is because if it's there, we're going to find it because we're sampling it at such a density. I've seen some of your uh, readouts or, you know, it is extremely easy to uh, look at your readouts and to understand exactly what's going on because you not only give, uh, you know, the actual parts per million, but you also give the, the dense, uh, you know, different colors like, like a street light you know, or a stoplight, uh, green, yellow and red, you know, which if you got, if you're in the red zone, you're, you're you got, you got a serious problem. If you're in, be, in the yellow zone, you got to, you got to start working on it. green. Don't worry about it. Right. Yep. It, we, we've designed it to be super simple to be able to see at a glance where the threat levels are. So your eyes are drawn to the colors. Red obviously is high risk. Yellow is moderate. Green means good. You don't have anything. And if there's, and, and then we also layer that on top of a, um, a ch you know, a bar chart so you can see how bad it is. And then with simple clicks on a field, you can go and you can look at across the entire, um, entire operation and see what your threat levels are. You can look at your fertility and biofertility, uh, press a button, it'll write a script for you. Um, you can go down and, and look at even down into each individual plot of 10 acre grid, what the levels are. And, you know, what I found surprising when I came here is that the, the inconsistency that occurs in a field where you're going to have uh, super high pressures in one area. And then the next grid, you could have absolutely nothing. And so it gives you that level of detail down to the field level. So the whole process starts right after the combines pull out, you want to get in there and you want to do the soil testing before tillage and everything before, so you can get across it e e easily. And then the soil samples are sent, sent off. So walk, walk us through that process and how long it takes to get results. Yeah, so the end-to-end -end process is that when, this, when the combine pulls out of the field, we need the dealer or the grower to go in, hit a button that says this field is ready or these fields are ready to sample. Within two to five days, barring any major weather events, our samplers will be out there uh, in those fields pulling the cores. They are two days shipped to our lab in uh, California. And once they're received, uh, they go through the process of, you know, we, we, we process the soils, extract everything down to a one mil subsample. That's what gets sequenced. That entire event from receipt into the lab to um, the results uh, automatically populating in our app is two weeks. So the results turn around, the grower can sit down with the seed dealer, they can make your, uh, select, uh, select your choices for the right variety, hybrid, trait, and um, seed treatment for each individual field. 
So we want to get the results back to inform decisions for next season's crop. Well, Mike, you know, we covered all the, the features and benefits that the farmers have on this great new technology. And by the way, Mershman Seeds makes no money on this. There's no kickback or anything. So th this is strictly a farmer introduction and dealer introduction for, as far as we're concerned because we think it's a valuable technology. And again, we have a farmer first mentality here. Um, and we just feel so strongly about it. That's why we brought Mike on. But Mike, there's always the question, what's it cost? It is the, it is the major question. And what we have designed this to be affordable um, because again, at the end of the day, we wanna help the grower. So for the full 360 degree view, which would be all of the pathogens, beneficials, um, as well as micro and macronutrients, it's the cost of about three quarters of a bushel or three quarters of a bushel of soybeans. Um, for if you just wanna look at the biologicals and you don't wanna look at um, your micros and macros every year, that's about a half a bushel of soybeans. And that would be per acre, correct? That is per acre, correct. Any other questions for Mike before we let him go? One of the biggest questions that I get, Mike, is what is your guys' preference on frequency? You know, uh, guys, nutrient soil sample once every three to four years. What's your preference on your guys' product? Yeah, so on pro-nutrient, it would be about the same thing, about every three to four years. Um, on biology, it really depends on what do you want to know, right? So corn rootworm pressure changes every year. Those beetles are going to fly somewhere. They're going to they're going to lay eggs. Those they do that frequently in soybeans. Um, we see lots of corn on corn, ten year con, ten year twenty year continuous corn that has absolutely no eggs in it. So the the variability of the pressures that exist in those fields of you know pathogens is going to change every year. So we recommend by, on a biological level, if you're looking at that, uh, to look at it every year. Um, you, you know, you go in for a checkup every year to see your doctor because your, your, your body changes. Well, the soil microbiome is far more complex than the human microbiome. And so it's constantly changing as well. Yeah, and, and Mike, you gave the, the 360 view, which is all inclusive, but you can break it down into uh, smaller pieces and you got a couple, you have options within that 360. So you can lower that, you can lower that cost if, if you just are interested in one area. Yeah. So if you're just interested in corn rootworm, cyst nematode and sudden death syndrome, that is a single product that's called the pressure panel. If you're interested in all the other diseases and biofertility attributes, that's called the performance panel. You can look at that and then the pro nutrient panel. Now we don't offer the ability for a grower to just be able to produce, uh, purchase the pro nutrient panel. That's uh, if, if you're interested in just the nutrient side of it, there's plenty of op options out there. Our wheelhouse is DNA sequencing and looking at biology. So um, those are your three options. Mike, what's the best way for growers if they want to, you know, get to your website or, you know, look just a little bit deeper into stuff? What's the best way for growers to do that? Yeah, to learn more, you can go to pattern.ag, pattern.ag. You'll find your uh, local representative. We have uh, two teams of folks in the field. I think it's important to cover that because it, it is the difference maker between what we do and what uh, maybe other companies do is we've got support after the sale. So we have a team of regional sales managers who set up our dealer network. And then we have a customer success team there that is there to ensure that the grower and the dealer have a great experience with us. They're there to troubleshoot anything. They're there to help with report delivery, any questions whatsoever, that team is there. So if you go to our website at pattern.ag, you'll find uh, your local representative in, uh, located in the Midwest. Yep. So if we have any dealers, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is get a hold of me or Lynn or Joe or Turk at our office here. And uh, if you'd like to be a dealer for that, uh, get a hold of one of us and we can get you hooked up with a correct sales manager for your territory. Yeah. And, and just a little bit from the dealer perspective, it, it's, it's a 2000 acre commitment to get started to be a dealer. So um, and I, I just think that you, you get the information out, you start talking to farmers, that's not going to be hard to, hard to meet. We don't get an objection from growers uh, at all. Uh, they're very curious about this, and uh, the, the uh, adoption and acceptance has been very, very uh, positive.
And we're happy to do that, or we're happy that that's happening because we know that we're going to be helping the grower. Yeah, you get 20 growers, do 100 acres, you got your 2,000 acres as a dealer, and you're ready to roll. So, because that's typically how it works. I mean, that's how it worked for us. We did, we did uh, uh, four farmers locally here and uh, t- to check out the technology uh, early last spring and, and um, found it very, very insightful, very insightful. One more thing I'd like to ask, Mike, is what's your something that you had talked about when we first started meeting was your customer retention. What's your customer customer retention look like? Yeah, our customer retention stands at about a hundred percent right now. Um, and typically, what happens is when they get their first results back, um, you know, the typical response is, "Well, I wish I would have sampled these other fields because I'd like to know what's going on in those as well." Uh, but our growth rate is typically about 50 percent, um, you know, after a grower comes on board because they're getting insights that they've never seen before uh, and are not available, uh, you know, in, in the way that we deliver it anywhere. Wonderful. Any other questions? Covered a lot of bases. Mike, you're a busy guy. Mike Tweedy with Pattern Ag, Director of Sales. We appreciate your time and uh, we're going to let you run because I know you're busy. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I have, a, have a great day, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to your audience. Awesome. Thanks. Well, that was really insightful. A uh, great tool for a farmer's toolbox if he chooses to, to look at it. But uh, And, Lynn, you, you, you had some field work, uh, actually had some pattern ag work done on, on your family farm. Any, any comments? Yeah. So, so my field was, uh, was like able to be to be tested for for everything and and we're a no-till operation on on our farm so one thing that was really surprising was just like the test plot there was just no biodiversity out in the field so was able to uh to to see see that and as we went into the year i um tested out some products that that, you know dive in the biological side of the world and uh um, i sent you the pictures last night ben and, and, and the response that the crop has had has been phenomenal i mean we've had not great growing conditions in my neck of the woods. And, and a lot that I've noticed um, anecdotally is, is my corn is holding on as far as the nitrogen side of stuff is. I'm not firing off on the bottom. Um, the, the check looks ugly, but the two products that are on each side that was, was tested um, definitely have a response from, from, a, from a plant. Um, outward observation. I'm not showing any deficiencies and, and, the, and the, the, the corn on it looks, looks so phenomenal. You're a little bit like our test plot. You were a, a biological desert, so you yeah. added some biologicals to stimulate uh, yeah. soil health and soil productivity and you're, you're seeing some results. Yeah, yeah. and it was, uh, you don't have to go brand name, but what were some of the, the products um, mode of action or what, what yeah. were you trying to do? Yep. So, so one um, was a, a hard chemistry product that was designed to stimulate the plant from a growth standpoint as a plant growth regulator. Um, and then the other product, I use more of a, a bug product to try to get similar results from, uh, from living organisms to kind of see where, where, where everything kind of stacked up as far as a, from a cost standpoint, from a management standpoint, because the, uh, the plant growth regulator that was, uh, you know, the, the hard chemistry side of it was, I mean, it's very easy to use. You, your application window is, is pretty broad. The shelf life is really good. On the bug side of it, you get a little bit more um, handcuffed, I guess, by lack of, of better terms. And, and this year it worked out great, was able to put both on at the same time. Um, weather-wise, uh, that's the nice part about having the, the individual with a drone. We actually applied it all via drone, so was able to, to go through and uh, not disrupt the, the crop either while we were, we were out there. So, um, yeah, so I'm trying two different I guess two different modes of actions, one from, from a biological standpoint and one from a hard chemistry standpoint, and, and both had a very, very strong response. Combine will tell me the last uh, bit, bit of the puzzle, so. Good. Good. Ben, what are you seeing out in the field? There's a lot of good, fun things going on here, but uh, the, the, this pattern ag ties in pretty tightly with uh, sudden death is starting to show up out in these fields, and it's, it's really curious on why we're seeing sudden death this year. It seems like we've had phenomenal uh, growing conditions for sudden death. I mean, uh, very wet, cool springs the past three, four years. And uh, it gives me a little bit of a head scratcher on why we're seeing it and the way we're seeing it. So uh, that's one thing to go out and scout and look at right now is sudden death. And the other thing that we're seeing a lot of is spider mites. And uh, my one thing that I kind of want to cue in to our, to our growers is, you know, it's not time to give up on this crop yet. A lot of areas here locally and even up, we're probably at R3, 
No, we're probably at R4 when I was up in Wisconsin this past week. Um, here locally, we're probably at that R5, R6 range. So we're getting real close to the, the finish line, but it's still enough time for a product like a pathogen like spider mites to still limit yield. So we'll overlay some pictures and show you guys, I mean, all the little brown circle spots, even the, the, the yellower circles that are out scattered throughout the field. Um, Lynn did some drone work for me. I did some drone work middle of this week and getting up and actually looking at stuff. It's amazing what you can see from an aerial view versus you know being six foot up in the air in the back of a pickup. Um, it, it's just amazing the tools that we have and uh, the threshold for uh, spider mites according to University of Nebraska-Lincoln is any of the stipul uh, any of the speckling that you see on the leaves halfway up the plant uh, is the economic threshold. So when we're seeing the spots in the top of the field, we're past economic threshold. So that's definitely a, a go time if you were to uh, want to protect what yield is still left out in that field because the weather pattern looks like we're probably going to be, uh, we're not seeing any huge torrential downpours that are in the forecast to wash those spider mites off the leaves and drown them out. Yeah, it's. It's hard to believe that within 200 miles, we went from a flood to a drought or dry weather, and that's kind of un not unusual. Uh, and so consequently, we're seeing everything this year. We're seeing all the problems this year. And so uh, that that's good and bad. It's good for learning, you know, learning about how soybean varieties perform in those various uh, situations, same way with corn hybrids. And then of course, seed treatments and, and other things that we work with to try to mitigate stress. So. Um, it's a great year for learning, um, you know, in positioning, and then of course using the technology from Pattern Ag uh, is just another layer of of things that we can do to to uh, make sure that we get the best chance to raise the highest yields possible. Yep. Well, Turk and I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the dicamba drift, and you know, the dicamba drift is is well, it's been six years. In fact, uh, I was talking to Harry Stein and. And it's devastated uh, our research plots for the past six years. And I, I know uh, I've written uh, our Senator Grassley, and uh, um, I've talked to Aaron Hager, the university uh, weed scientist from Illinois, this past week. And we just had a lot of discussion. And I've also talked to a grower this past week uh, that's going through the clean process, and I want to comment about that. But in general, um, uh, it, it, it's still a serious problem, and we're not seeing any mitigation by the new changes in the labels and education. Um, we're still having problems. And Turk, you might talk just a little bit about an, a comment period that just opened up. Yeah, so yesterday uh, the EPA announced a 60-day comment period for anybody that had comments on uh, their experiences and their recommendations for the EPA about dicamba use in the field, uh, spe specifically over top or, or otherwise, you know, pros and cons. And so uh, I think it's very, very important that if, if you have had a, an experience that you do make a comment on this comment period. I agree with you 100%. I actually, I was talking to a grower last week and uh, he's got a timber and uh, he had a, a tree buyer come in and evaluate, you know, you know what some of these trees could be worth and if he should harvest you know and the tree buyer said well you might as well take your red oaks out right away now too and and the farmer said well why is that he says well there's some chemical that's killing them and he says, i can't remember the name of it and our farmer says dicamba yep that's it i mean that's pretty incredible because it's a cumulative process on trees in other words if they just keep getting hit over time it, they can absorb some of it, but eventually they're gonna die. So he's seeing uh, a trend where the red oak is dying in areas where uh, there's a lot of off-target movement. Uh, the, the thing that concerns me is our MS Tech breeding program. If we're constantly getting hit with dicamba, what we're inadvertently doing is selecting for dicamba tolerant varieties. And because of that, uh, we're not necessarily selecting for the highest yielding varieties, so it's skewing our, our data. Uh, yeah, we're getting better. The newer products seem to be able to tolerate dicamba, but we're overlooking the other aspects of yield. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about, um, and there was an article from Progressive Farmer, which we'll post, and 
it just basically says everything we just said. You know that you know there's we're we're not seeing change. So you should read it and just see what it says. But I don't think that's enough to influence the EPA. It's going to take farmers actually going in on that site, and we'll we'll put that link up there too, mm -hmm. so you can go in and write your comment, and um, and 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 uh, make sure they know from the grassroots what's really going on. The other thing I'd like to talk about, and, th and this really bothers me a lot, and and it and it's because uh, I, I have a farmer that's down by Springfield, and he's a darn good farmer. Um, pays attention to all the dots the I's, crosses the T's. I don't know anybody that pays more attention to the details. Well, in 2019, he had he had injury, and I told him I said I would I would keep all your records and and make sure you have everything because you know there there could be compensation. Sure enough, Monsanto put up a 300 million dollar fund for compensation for off target movement. So he's been going through this process, and he's taken all his data from you know the uh, all all factual data. I mean, in other words, everything he has. It's not a guess or anything. It's it's actual yield numbers, yield maps. Everything is documented, and, he, and for all practical purposes, he's figured he has a seven bushel loss from dicamba in 2019. So he's gone through and submitted all this to the claims the Monsanto Claims uh, Settlement, they call it the Dicamba Soybean Settlement Claims Administrator. As, and, and lo and behold, he gets a, a letter. And I've turned this into the EPA, I've also turned it into our, uh, my, my senator, and says I'm giving you official notice that you know, your claim is being audited. And it basically goes on to say, if we find any fraudulent activity, you know, you're gonna be responsible for the total cost of the audit, everything associated with it. And this particular farmer, he says, you know, I've done everything third party. I have nothing that's subjective or I'm guessing or anything. It's all third party. He says, I've, I've responded many, many times to the request for data. In fact, he had to go back to 2014 on his data for a 2019 claim. He's done everything by the book. And then it goes on to say, now, if you don't want to go through the audit, of course, you can sign off on this uh, and, and withdraw your claim. And I just think that's wrong. And I'm, I'm just want, I just want to let folks know about it. And hopefully some, uh, some folks that have some common sense that, and say that even though this money's out there, they make it impossible. It's, it's like almost like the hot dog and, and the stick in front of the dog pulling the cart. You know, you, you can never get it. And uh, so this concerns me. And... Uh, you know me, if there's a farmer that needs help, we, we try to help them. So anyhow, that's the negative that I have to say, but we really would appreciate those of you that have had off-target movement to, to get on that site and, and feed, give them feedback because we know this is, it, it, it is such an emotional thing because nobody wants to go against their neighbor. Nobody wants to have repercussions for doing something. So it's it's a it's a sad day in agriculture in my opinion it gets brought up at every seed day yeah. I, I wish i could plant your product but i can't yep we're we're, we're losing business because farmers say I, I have to go the other route because of the fact that I, I i don't want to have a fight with my neighbor i don't want to have these issues now you should know that this year 55 percent we believe that's joe mercerman believes 55 percent of the acres in the united states were in list e3 acres so we are the dominant trait now we are the number one trait we passed up the competitor so we should have some say so in this fight in other words we are the farmers are preferring our trait over the other brand so um that should that should why should the in this case uh this and it doesn't necessarily happen on soybean applications it's happening on corn too like, you know, there's a lot of products uh, Dicamba put on corn, so it, it's a very tough situation. And I don't want to see any herbicide go by the wayside. I just want to see us able to coexist. So, anyhow, enough said. Let's get to the corny joke. I've got I've got one here, Ben. I've been pick thinking. Pick on me. Yeah, I'm going to pick on you because I'm going to ask you this question. Okay, it's a question, and see if you can answer it. You you got two vegans. Okay. And they're in a heated argument. I mean, they're really not, you know, drag out a heated argument. Is that still considered a beef? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. We ended on a high note. That's the most important thing. Um, 
challenges, uh, you know, they, they always say a problem identified as a blessing is the ones you don't know about that are the ones that are dangerous. So, uh, and they also say, uh, if, you're in, if you have no problems, you have no business. So uh, I, I just told our, our, all our folks this past week, I said, we've been so blessed, you know, <laughs> we, got, we got lots of problems. That means we got a lot of business. So we'll work through them. We have been for uh, almost going on uh, 69 years. So. Thanks for watching today. It's a long episode, but we hope you find it valuable. We appreciate your business. Uh, get those combines ready because it's, it's going to happen real quick. See you next week. Take care.